Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Teleprompters is a 2013 song by The Uncluded, a short-lived collaboration between folk singer Kimya Dawson and rapper Aesop Rock. At its heart, it's a song about anxiety, with Dawson singing about the importance of self-care. This is why when I'm on stage, my eyes are closed, I'm in a haze. While Aesop explores isolation and avoidance. Big dummy dig a hole in the dirt, he put his head in the hole, he is alone in this world. But even if you ignore the lyrics, it's pretty clear just from listening to it that the two artists are performing not just as two different people, but two different personas, with different perspectives, experiences, and relationships to the song's themes. And part of that is delivery. Dawson's earnest, out-of-tune singing conveys a character who's doing their best to get by, while Aesop's abrasive flow says he just wants to be left alone. But there's more going on here. In between their voices and your ears are layers upon layers of vocal production, all of which serve to enhance the differences between these personas. This is the art of vocal placement using the mix to align the voice with its intended character. But how does it work? The most common tool theorists use to describe a mix is a model called the Soundbox, described independently by Drs. Alan Moore and Ann Danielson. You can think of it as, like, a box, but instead of an actual physical space, it represents a sort of perceptual space. It's the room these sounds sound like they're happening in. But with normal stereo speakers, you don't get a lot of direct information about distance, so in order to map out our sound box, we replace the three spatial dimensions with three different musical parameters that serve as useful approximations. The first dimension is probably the most obvious. Panning. This is the one piece of direct physical information you can convey with just stereo speakers. If a sound is louder in the left speaker than the right one, it'll sound like it's coming from your left side. The same is true for the right side. This phenomenon allows you to arrange different instruments in different directions as if they were on a stage in front of you, and it's the entire point of stereo sound. There's a lot that could be said about panning, but surprisingly little of it is relevant to a discussion of vocal placement. In popular recorded music, lead vocals are almost always panned pretty close to the center of the mix to help the listener focus on them. There are some exceptions, like Space Oddity, commencing countdown engines on. where David Bowie pans voices to different sides in order to create a sense of distance and wonder. In a typical pop song, though, you'll really only hear it when two voices are singing together. The second dimension of the sound box is pitch, which takes the place of up and down. This is perhaps the most artificial of the three dimensions in that it really has nothing to do with the physical position of the sound. There's no acoustic basis for it. Higher notes don't appear to be coming from a higher location. That's just an analogy. But this whole thing is an analogy, and you'd be hard-pressed to argue that pitch isn't an important part of music. In fact, it's a particularly important part of musical mixes because sounds occupying the same register can easily interfere with each other. If you try to stack a bass guitar, a tuba, and a low-voiced singer on top of each other, you're gonna have to be really careful to avoid winding up with a thick, muddy track. And pitch is definitely a significant component of vocal placement. I talked about it extensively in my video on analyzing voices. But this does also stray a bit into the vocal delivery side of the equation. Barring overt autotune effects like in Bartender, The register of a vocalist has a lot more to do with how they sang the lines than anything the engineer did. For our purposes, then, the most important dimension of the sound box is prominence. This is how far away the voice seems to be. Obviously, all the sounds you hear from your speakers are the same distance from you, but there are a couple ways that a song's mix can create the illusion of depth. The first is volume. Louder sounds feel closer. Next is reverb and echo. In the real world, these sorts of effects happen when a sound is coming from further away, bouncing off various walls and surfaces on its way to our ears. Then there's timbre. Lower frequency sound waves travel further, while higher frequencies are more easily absorbed by the environment, so faraway voices tend to sound dull. And finally, there's perceived volume. We know from experience that certain sounds tend to have certain volumes, and we can use that to gauge the implied distance of the actual source. For example, a whisper and a shout could be played back at the same volume, and the shout would feel further away because it has the sonic markers of a much louder source. Within the sound box, judgments of prominence are ultimately pretty subjective, but by considering these four factors, we can at least begin to imagine where the source is positioned within the acoustic landscape. 
This matters because different social interactions take place at different distances, and our understanding of a song's story is shaped in part by how close the singer feels to us. To describe this, more turns to Dr. Edward Hall's concept of proxemics. While it's true that two people can be pretty much any distance apart, Hall argues that there are certain boundaries where the social implications of distance fundamentally shift. He uses those boundaries to define four proxemic zones, or regions of distance that you might expect to maintain in different social situations. The exact size of these zones varies by culture, and doesn't translate directly to the more abstract discussion of musical distance anyway, but the idea is a useful one for understanding the implications of vocal placement. The closest zone is intimate space, where it feels like the singer is nearly touching you. Here, the voice is placed right at the front of the sound box, with no other musical material near it. The vocal delivery will probably be soft, maybe even a whisper, but the voice itself will be very loud compared to the accompaniment, if there is any accompaniment at all. You'll likely be able to hear many of the non-vocal sounds involved in singing, like smacking lips and the intake of breath. From that description, you might assume that intimate space is just for songs about, well, intimacy. And yeah, that's fairly common. There are many romantic contexts where you might enter this space, and love has always been a popular thing to write songs about. But it's not the only option. In bodies... Let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies hit the floor. Dave Williams employs many of the same sonic markers for a very different effect. That's because, as Hall points out, humans don't just use intimate space for erotic purposes. We also use it for wrestling and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Zooming out a bit, we find ourselves in personal space. This is the range you might use for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You're not touching anymore, but they're probably within arm's reach. Here, the vocal delivery is a little louder, because you can't rely on a whisper to be heard at this range, and the voice has moved further back from the front of the sound box. There's still some separation between the voice and the accompaniment, but less. The vocals themselves are reasonably dry, with maybe a little reverb to create a sense of space. In Wuthering Heights, Kate Bush sings at a comfortable speaking volume, accompanied by a solo piano. She feels close, but not right up against your ear. Next is social space, which is used in group settings or more formal conversations like, say, a performance review with your boss. Here, both parties maintain a greater distance to avoid any sense of direct physical intimacy. People's physical features are less apparent at this range as they take up less of your field of vision and become more a part of the environment, which is reflected in musical settings as well. A singer portraying social space will typically be around the center of the sound box. The accompaniment is relatively loud, and some parts of it may wind up in front of the singer. Singer. Vocal delivery will start to get louder as well, and you might hear more environmental effects like reverb and delay to increase the sense of distance. In Pastime Paradise, you can hear how Stevie Wonder feels less like he's speaking directly to you, and more like he's addressing a group. Musically, he's engulfed within the mix, with multiple other instruments vying for attention. The details of his vocal tone are hard to make out, and while he isn't shouting, he sounds like he's trying to be heard. And finally, we have public space, used for, well, being in public. At this range, you're probably not directly interacting with the other person at all, and if you are, it's probably in a non-personal context, like listening to a speaker at a political rally. In public space, the vocals are placed toward the rear of the sound box, fully integrated within the overall mix. Other instruments are more prominent, and the singer really has to project in order to cut through. In Shine, Lejean Witherspoon's vocals are clearly struggling to be heard over the rest of the band, especially Morgan Rose's drums. It's worth noting, of course, that a voice can move through multiple proxemic zones in a song. Earlier in Shine, this is the last time. Witherspoon feels much closer. In the context of this sort of metal, I might even call this personal space, and the way he moves between these different zones as the song progresses shapes our understanding of the story he's telling. And all of that is great. It's a really useful way of describing the overall impact of the voice within the mix, but because it rolls so many different factors into one value, it can be a little hard to compare. Two different songs could have two completely different vocal treatments that still both wind up conveying the same proxemic space. Like, let's go back to teleprompters from the beginning. How does the placement of Dawson's voice... Like ticker tape, the words appear, there's a parade between my ears... ...compared to their placement in, say, TV on 10? You hold my hand reluctantly, but you look at me like I am crazy. The latter voice is quieter, but it doesn't feel more distant to me. 
It just feels smaller. You could argue that the more saturated accompaniment pushes them into social space, but that doesn't really fit with how I hear it. I'd probably put these both in personal space, so how else can we explain why they sound so different? And how can we compare the treatment of their voice to the treatment of Aesop's in the same songs? For this, I'm going to turn to a recent paper by Dr. Michelle Duguay, who proposes a five-dimensional system specifically for describing vocal placement. By focusing on just this one aspect of the mix, she's able to give us a lot more information to work with. For the rest of this video, I'm going to show how this might work by comparing and contrasting the two voices of the Uncluded in both teleprompters and TV on 10 to see how they treat the same voice in different stories and different voices in the same story. How do they turn Dawson and Aesop into personas that fit the song's narratives? Plus, it's an excuse to talk about two great songs that I probably couldn't get anyone to click on a video about. Listen to the Uncluded. They're great. Anyway, like with the sound box, Duguay's model starts by considering stereo sound. But since lead vocals are almost always panned in the middle anyway, she doesn't bother with positioning. Instead, she considers width. Is the voice straight down the middle, or do parts of it spread out to different sides? How much of the lateral space does the voice occupy? Listening to teleprompters, Dawson's voice I'm making vases out of snakes, I'm a kiln half full of mistakes is distributed across a fairly wide range. We'll talk about how they achieve that later, but for now, the important thing is that if we compare it to Aesop, Buzz, pain, crisscross, arms in a tub ring, learned heartbreak when a Zelda one subscreen, we see that his voice is much more centralized. He's more clearly in front of us while Dawson surrounds us. And the same thing happens in TV on 10, as well as other included songs like Aquarium and Delicate Cycle. In fact, in Duguay's analysis of various collaborations between Rihanna and Eminem, she found the same thing. When a track has a singer and a rapper, the singer's voice is typically mixed wider. This might speak to the different roles the artists perform in that kind of collaboration. Aesop is primarily functioning as a storyteller with a verse full of complex narrative details. A tight, centralized mix puts him in stark focus, inviting you to listen carefully to his words. Dawson, on the other hand, is speaking more metaphorically, evoking broad emotions with abstract imagery, so a wide, resonant mix invites you to really feel their message. Next, we've got range. Again, similar idea to the sound box, but since we don't have to worry about the extreme non-vocal registers, we can zoom in a bit and pick out more details. In teleprompters, both vocalist ranges are pretty constrained. Dawson mostly sits between G3 and B3, with an occasional step up to middle C. A walkie-talkie on a mission, Roger, Roger, will I listen? Aesop's pitch is a little more approximate, but he doesn't seem to be moving much. Running his first verse through Melodyne, it says he's basically just sitting around a low D. Most of his delivery takes place within a half step of that note, with rare trips outside of it to emphasize specific words. Now I'm signing up for figure drawing class in a tux like a gentleman. These limited ranges create characters who feel restrained and stuck, with Dawson trying to push through while Aesop teeters on the edge of giving up completely. TV on 10, though, tells a very different story. Dawson's low note is that same G, Cause if I know where we are at. But their range is much wider, going all the way up to F sharp. Planes almost never crash, you say. In both cases, their character is anxious, but these different ranges show two very different kinds of anxiety. Teleprompters is a dull, constant stress, but TV on 10 is a direct, acute fear. They're on a plane, and they're afraid of flying. That heightened awareness to the threat of this specific situation expresses itself in bursts of higher notes as they fight back the panic. But the real change here is Aesop. In teleprompters, he mostly sat on one note, but here he's running all over. Again, approximate pitches, but check out his opening line. Five in a jam with a TV on 10, 229 meeting in a TV on 10. I'd say that's covering over an octave, easily, and the rest of the verse is similarly acrobatic. And that makes sense. TV on 10 is a very personal story from his childhood about being in the room when his friend found out from a news report that his mother had died in a plane crash. That wide, expressive range lets us hear the story progress from idle channel surfing but a casual flip is a light show, nice roll. to denial, desperation, Halifax divers find no survivors, we just need the name of the city you were flying towards, and ultimately grief. The third parameter is prominence again, but this time we're doing things a little differently. In Moore's approach, prominence is a combination of multiple factors used to describe an overall sense of apparent distance. Duguay splits those factors out into their own categories, so what she calls prominence is basically a measure of volume. Or more precisely amplitude, which isn't the same thing, but higher amplitudes create higher volumes, so, you know, 
close enough. Anyway, this one we can measure directly. We just take the average amplitude of the isolated vocal track, divide it by the amplitude of the full mix in that same section, and boom, we've got a number. Like in the verse of teleprompters, the amplitude of Dawson's voice Ever since I was a kid on the backs of my two eyelids is about 85% the amplitude of the whole track. Ever since I was a kid on the backs of my two eyelids Now that doesn't mean they're 85% of what you're hearing. Sound math is more common complicated than that. But it tells us that if we strip out everything but their voice, it doesn't actually get much quieter, making them very prominent in the mix. Aesop, on the other hand, is only about 55% of the total amplitude in his verse, so he feels much more distant. First learn to eat pain at St. Peter's preschool, young. Now that's a painkiller I can speak through. The rest of the track encroaches on his acoustic space in a way it doesn't with Dawson, leaving him feeling more isolated and alone. Again, in teleprompters, Dawson is finding ways to cope, partly by connecting with other other people, so it makes sense that they would feel closer. In TV on 10, though, that's not the case. Dawson is still slightly louder, but both artists only take up about 40% of the mix each. This isn't necessarily because they're quieter. Dawson is, but Aesop's levels are about the same in both songs. The big difference is the backing track. If we compare the raw loop of teleprompters, <laughs> to TV on 10, You can hear how much louder and more oppressive the second one is. It invades the vocalist's space in a way the first one didn't, forcing them to battle against it instead of just floating on top. This change in the sonic landscape changes our perspectives on these characters, putting us right inside those terrifying situations with them. And it's especially potent in Dawson's case, right as we cross to blue for green, the fiery terror will engulf me. where the louder track is met with a much quieter voice, making them feel extremely small and afraid. Next, we come to the environment, the space the sound appears to be made in. This is largely created with audio effects like reverb and echo that simulate the acoustic properties of a real physical room. The thicker those effects, the larger that room feels. Importantly, Duguay doesn't tie these effects to distance like Moore does. She argues that they're better understood as properties of the space, not properties of the voice. In the right environment, you might hear a significant echo even if the person speaking was right next to you. Now, to be perfectly honest, effects are not my specialty. I'm a theorist, not an audio engineer, so in order to get a more complete picture, I reached out to my friend Mike Wirth, who runs a great channel on recording, mixing, and running a studio. He actually just did a video specifically on mixing vocals, so if you want to know how to do this yourself, I'll put a link in the description so you can check that out. Anyway, huge thanks to Mike for his help. Anything insightful in this section is probably his doing, and any mistakes are because I misunderstood him. In both songs, Dawson's voice is treated pretty similarly, with some solid reverb to create a sense of space. There seems to be more of it in teleprompters. I look like I'm made out of clay. I'm overwhelmed and underglazed. Bringing to mind a stage in a concert hall while TV on 10. Take a deep breath. Try to relax. Just close the shade. Don't start to panic. Is smaller, capturing the more enclosed, claustrophobic space of an airplane. Aesop's voice is also similar in both tracks. He's largely left dry with little to no reverb, allowing his dense lyrics to be heard without much interference. But there is one other kind of effect that I need to mention here. In teleprompters, his voice is super compressed. Compare this, Tale of a plane crash, typical affliction of flinch that changed past, which feels like normal human speech, to this, Last on a kickball team draft pick list, first to the king, Colin practice in his kick flips, which feels like it's coming out of a cheap speaker, creating a different kind of distance. The sound source may be reasonably close to you, but Aesop himself, or more precisely Aesop's persona, doesn't even feel like he's in the same room. And that brings us to our final parameter, layering. It's fairly common in modern music to have an artist record the same part multiple times, either in unison or with some added harmonies. Typically, the goal is to match the original as closely as possible in order to blend seamlessly, but this sort of lo-fi production calls for a different approach. In both songs, Dawson's voice is clearly layered, but in teleprompters, Whammies and noise, be void and null, I feel a tingle in my skull. The voices aren't particularly well aligned. Instead of feeling polished, then, this makes their persona feel earnest and vulnerable, like they're opening up about some deeply held insecurities. In the chorus, they drop down to a solo voice, But now I need to hear them too. 
I am beautiful. To reflect the increased confidence of the lyrics. In TV on 10, the layering is tighter. Fight back tears, my biggest fear. Something going wrong while we are up here. And that natural chorus effect feels almost like depersonalization in a moment of blind terror. Aesop, on the other hand, is rarely doubled and never by his own voice, but occasionally Dawson will join him for a particularly important line. In teleprompters, this is reserved for the refrain at the end of his verses. You need to get out more. Never, I am nailed to the walls in a jail made of deserts. So that he's mostly left alone, but in TV on 10, they're littered throughout the story. Now a quote from his homeboy Jeremy. My mother took a night flight out of Kennedy. What? what? Punctuating key moments and creating a sense of immersion in the environment. Taken together, these five parameters give us a much clearer picture of the similarities and differences between the voices in these two tracks, and a better understanding of exactly how they create their particular vocal personas. But the nice thing about analytical models is you don't have to pick just one. The sound box gives us a snapshot of the vocals within the context of the complete mix, something Duguay's system reduces to a single variable in the prominence setting, so there's plenty of value in using both. And they're not the only models out there, either. I already did a video on Victoria Malawi's three-pronged approach to analyzing the voice itself, link in the description, and it's not hard to see how that could be relevant here as well. And that's what I love about music theory. It's a conversation. Different theorists with different perspectives build tools to match their specific interests, and then the rest of us can take those tools, combine them with our own ideas, and make even deeper insights. The more people are involved in the conversation, the better the tools get, and with more and more theorists turning their attention to the importance of the recorded voice, I think we've got a lot to look forward to. Anyway, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to our featured patrons, Kevin Wilimowski, Susan Jones, Jill Sundgaard, Duck, Howard Levine, Warren Hewitt, and Damian Fuller Sutherland. If you want to help out and help us make the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.